Welcome, Jigisha. It's a great pleasure of having you. Jigisha Patel, everyone, from Jigisha Patel Research Integrity Limited in London, UK. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. It's a great pleasure indeed. And um, for you guys out there, um, so the way I met Jigisha was actually on LinkedIn when I saw one of your um, infographs being shared about how to inquire consent by patients for medical researchers. And, um, and then I reached out to you because I found this really important as a topic. And normally when you think about research consent and stakeholder engagement in any research topic, and in particular for medical research, um, yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, there's a lot of debate about it, like how can we ensure consent by patients for how their um, medical data should and can be used for research at large, not only for their very treatments. Um, so we, should we just jump right into it and you sharing with us what made you come up with such a simple, I mean, not simple in its essence, but um, like basically a one pager infographic um, and why that also basically went viral on, on LinkedIn. What do you think was, or how did, how did it come about with this and why is it so, so well received out there? So I, I deal a lot with research integrity issues and I have a medical background. So, um, I mean, I've done clinical research myself. So I sort of have, um, um, in publication ethics and research ethics issues sort of in the foreground of my thinking all the time when I'm reading clinical research or handling research integrity cases. And I have noticed so many times when reading an article or handling a case that the statement in a manuscript, you know, informed consent was obtained from all participants or you know, informed consent was um, obtained from the patients. You know, this is a throwaway line in a manuscript, you know, but authors just write this line. And it's clear if you read the methodology or you read the, the actual research that the authors were not taking this, you know, would, did not really understand what they meant by this statement. It, it seems to be like a tick box exercise where this statement is put in a manuscript just to get through, you know, journal mm. policy requirements. But consent is the most important thing about research in humans. You know, it's a fundamental, you cannot do research in humans without their, um, you know, full understanding of what that research is, and then their consent to, to take part in that research. So I wanted to um, you know, talk about this because I'm a, I'm a trainer. That's what I, I I train on research integrity. I want to um, share my sort of experience and knowledge. So I wanted to talk about consent, and it's quite a, a dull subject. So you know, writing a three or four paragraphs of well, you know, this is this type mm -hmm. of consent, this is that type of consent. I thought wouldn't particularly be engaging. So I thought I will do a visual representation. Mm -hmm. of the different types of consent and what it actually means because um, I wanted it to be a very quick reference for anyone who has who anyone who needs to think about consent be it researchers or editors um, I wanted to have something that they could very quickly look at and quickly understand what the different types of consent were and then be able to apply that to um, their reading so when they read a manuscript or an article they can see whether the statement actually matches mm -hmm. the research and whether that statement is appropriate mm -hmm. um, so that was that was that was just sort of the background to it so it took me quite a long time because uh, I played around with different formats to, to see how I could condense that information into mm -hmm. a really digestible um, snippet on, as you say on, on one page so yeah. that, that was the background to that info infographic or, or really a table or diagram that I did mm -hmm. for me to I mean, I personally would assume that most researchers would want to ensure that the patients they work with or patients' data they work with um, is in consent with the very patients in question. But to what degree can that be achieved, given that most patients actually have some serious challenges, health challenges, and then 
I don't know. Okay, that's, I mean, it's a difficult question to answer, but maybe as researchers, if we put ourselves in the patient's shoes, there are those who probably just want to be treated and be healthy again. And then those mm. who think beyond their own destiny, it's like, okay, as we're on it, we might as well, you know, make the data available for further research. But, and then also like the researchers um, are not often from what I've heard, um, I come from a basic um, or a basic research biology background. And um, like how often is it really that the researchers are in touch with the patients? Isn't it that they usually get the data from the medical staff and the practitioners, and then those have to seek consent from the patients and then the researchers have to trust that the consent was given without really knowing to what extent and how well it was explained to the patients. Okay, there's like 10 questions in, in one. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and go backwards. So for, with your last question, so researchers who do clinical research do to directly collect the data. It is expected that it's the researchers will, um, you know, write the information for the participants mm -hmm. and talk to the participants, tell them what the research is about and get the consent to participate in the research. So that, I think researchers who do clinical research understand that aspect of it very clearly. They know that's part of the process. Mm. And um, a good research ethics committee will require that. So a protocol for a bit of uh, clinical research, it, they won't approve it without having, without the researchers showing them how they're going to inform the patients or participants and how they're going to obtain consent. So that is for prospective research, go, you know, going forward in the future where you're recruiting people to, to take part in your research. And that is consent to participate in the research. Mm. But you can be distanced from the patients when it's a retrospective study. So sometimes researchers are not recruiting patients to, to study going into the future. They're just collecting clinical data that has been collected already um, as part of the usual care of patients. So in that case, it's not so much obtaining consent, it's obtaining some permission from the people who are who own the data, who, who own the clinical data. So it may be the hospital or it may be the, um, in, in the UK, it may be the NHS, National Health Service Trust. And so the researchers need permission, usually via, again, an ethics committee to, to use this clinical data because it's still human data. And, you know, and sometimes I see, oh, well, you know, authors say we didn't need to get approval from an ethics committee because this was just numbers this was just data we didn't touch any patients but that's incorrect you know it's still patient information it's it's meant to be confidential so for a researcher to go in access it and use it they require proper permission so mm. that is for retrospective studies but where um, researchers get confused i think is they understand the idea of getting consent to participate. Sometimes they confuse that with consent to treatment. So, mm. you know, they will say, oh, the patient consented to receive this treatment and think that is enough, but that's not enough. That was the consent to actually be treated for their condition. You know, it wasn't consent to take part in any kind of research or have their details um, published in a case report. No. And then the other type of consent that they really don't, are unaware of. I mean, this is not because researchers don't want to do the right thing. I think they just don't understand. Mm. It's the consent to publish. And this ties in with, you know, regulations on the right to privacy, because it's very easy um, these days with the internet and everything that, you know, only a few details about an individual are needed to be able to trace back and find, find their identity. Mm. And people have the right to privacy. They have the right to remain anonymous. And so consent is needed to publish details that might identify them. And this applies to case reports where, you know, a person's age and a person's gender or a person's clinical, you know, their medical condition, maybe photographs, things like that get published. Mm. And they can be identified. So they need to be aware of this risk and be prepared to give consent despite this risk. And mm. this is a concept that often is confused 
with the other types of consent. And so the authors don't um, make that distinction when they write the statement. You know, it doesn't make the statement doesn't make sense because um, it, it's often clear to me that they didn't understand the differences between these different types of consent, mm -hmm. which again, which is what motivated me to make that um, diagram or create yeah. the table. Yeah. Yeah, thinking about for myself, like, wouldn't it also be, well, it's also an obvious um, question for consent or not for a patient to agree to be turned into a research subject besides being a human being and with willpower and all of that. It's not that it's been taken away, but even for me, who, who is or has been a researcher practicing like to put us like to be in such a vulnerable position, you just want to get support and help and not be seen as a subject or object in some cases also, or have some of your body parts turned into objects, <laughs> like just, yeah. just while you're still alive. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a bit of a philosophical approach, but still we're human beings, we are in part spiritual, if we um, agree or if we are conscious about it or not, I mean, it doesn't mean that we have to pursue a religion, but it's just an awkward, it's, it's, a, it's an important decision to take for the stakeholder patient. And even if the, the potential benefit for other patients is obvious, but still it's like, it's almost like agreeing to donate organs in a, in a way. Mm. It is a way of organ donation as well, just in, in numbers, but still, I mean, the data is coming out of our organs. Um, and that's not necessarily uh, a decision that we take with pure ratio, but we also put our feelings, belief systems and everything into it. So therefore it's, I think, especially cautious and respectful, <clears throat> or respect and caution is needed on the researcher's side who, who of course have an interest to learn and to acquire knowledge. And I often think it's for the greater benefit, but then to what extent and to what ex expense as well. Um, so yeah, I agree. It's super. Yeah, it's, it's a highly important topic, obviously, and it's key to research integrity in medical and biomedical and bioscience research. Um, so how how was the response after you shared um, your infograph? Like I've seen it being shared by colleagues whom we both know. That's why how I ran into it. How was the feedback that you received from it? Yes, it was, it was very positive. I think it was a useful tool. I, I, I focused it for medical editors who run medical journals mm. um, as a quick sort of tool that would enable them to check manuscripts when they're submitted um, and, and pick out the ones where the authors need to be queried about, you know, giving more details about their consent procedure. So I think, I mean, from that perspective, I think it was well received in that it is a useful tool for them. Mm -hmm. So, um, Yes, yeah, so I'm thinking of what other topics I could do similar things for, because I think that's what's needed. Very quick and easy ways of condensing complicated concepts into very simple mm. and something you can have on your desktop and this, you know, open and have a quick look at just to get the answer you need when you're actually working and looking at a manuscript. So that's what the, the scenario I had in mind, I imagined there would be a medical editor reading a manuscript and wondering about the consent statement. How could I make it easy for them to um, decide whether that statement was okay? So, mm. but yeah. Yeah, and I can also imagine research students to be grateful to have this on their desk because it just summarizes so nicely all the checkpoints, all the important aspects to consider when it comes to patient's consent. And it can be confusing, it can be also morally challenging in mm. direction, mm. but then to have it like in you know, one picture with nice um, graphic design and mm. eye appealing as well, it just makes it easy for our brains to process and then to go into the details nonetheless. I mean, it doesn't end there, but at least it's a, yeah, it's like a map or, or like an overview of here's what you need to think about either when you check manuscripts or as you prepare your research proposal. And yeah, and this is what it means to, to receive consent or for a patient to give consent also to, like I used to work a different context, but I used to work with, um, to some extent still do with indigenous communities. 
And that's also you kind know, of several stakeholders um, need to come to terms. And when it's about indigenous people's territories and also knowledge sharing with researchers or policymakers or whatever, or economists, um, they're like, like informing them is not enough. There's a need for prior and informed consent. Like, because in the practice, like there, there's been and continue to be um, horrible human rights violations and the people in practice think, well, we told them what's going to happen. So, and they sort of, well, they didn't have much of a say, but, and then the consent is key. And the information needs to be, to happen before the actual extraction of knowledge or extraction of um, plants and animals. But, um, and that's really the case. I can imagine maybe it's also similar in some instances, hopefully not common, like when it comes to patient data, that the research has already been done and just before publishing, consent is being sought just because we need it as a checkbox. Um, so yeah, again, like prior and informed consent also plays here is, is yeah, so to empower also the patients to make an informed decision and to be able to form judgments beyond their own feelings and fears they might have but to really see the bigger picture of the research question and that it can actually that it has a good chance of of bigger benefit for themselves and others and i think that's also when consent can be given more easily by many patients as if they were like oh we have a research project and you are you have the honor on contributing your data to it <laughs> like like I, I would feel awkward about it like okay what kind of research what what are you actually asking and it's not enough to say for the sake of science and just because we can learn things we don't know about just yet but really i think it also calls for a proper research proposal and contextualization what kind of patients data come in and what's the expected outcome i would suspect that's often the case but also knowing how research can go especially basic research Sometimes we don't know ourselves, and then it's probably also important to let the patients know. Like we don't know what we can find, but we hope to find us in that, and it's probably good enough of a reason for them to agree. Mm. I think you touched on a lot of really interesting points there. I think you mentioned respect, which I think is paramount, mm. and. I mean, I think the culture where, you know, researchers are under pressure to publish a lot of research and they can often forget or lose sight of the fact that they are dealing with human beings here, um, you know, because they're so keen to get the, get the numbers, get the numbers they need for their power calculation to do their research. And they forget that they're actually recruiting human beings and they need to sort of um, always bear that in mind. Um, another point to make is that, remember, people can withdraw their consent as well. So you were talking about obtaining consent in advance, but, but at any point during a piece of research, um, a, a researcher can say, I don't want to do this anymore and withdraw their consent from it. But even after research has been published, for example, in case reports, if an individual's individual details are published and they gave consent to do that so that it was published, they can still withdraw their consent and there have been cases where publications have had to be retracted because the individuals have said, I no longer um, want my details to be published mm -hmm. um, out there. And then the, the other point you made about why researchers take part in research. I think when there's, when there's research into a, a medical condition or a clinical condition, often the, 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 the patients and participants with the condition are... Uh, you know, don't want other people to go through what they've been through. And that's why they're motivated is very much because they want to help the next wave of people who have that condition get better treatment. Um, it's often harder to um, recruit healthy people as the control group because they're asking, why should I do this? I'm, I'm being put at, at, at risk. So they, for them, there is very little personal benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a very big disparity between not, you know, healthy people taking part in research and people who actually have medical conditions. The people with medical conditions are probably more likely to want to take part. Mm -hmm. And also for them, there might be a benefit if they are, start, if they are research part, taking part in research that involves an experimental intervention, 
uh, maybe a new drug or a new technique, they might even benefit from receiving that new drug or technique. So mm. that's why um, people are motivated to take part in research as well. Mm. But, but I think the bottom line, as you said, was the respect for the respect that these are human beings and it's very hard for researchers who are under pressure to publish a lot mm. to get research done to um, remember to remember this and you know remember they're dealing with humans. So mm. yeah, I'd like to continue on what you just said. What does publication pressure do to research integrity in your um, yeah in medical research where you're um, mm. kind of, uh, familiar with mostly? It's the driving force in most cases. I mean, why do why do authors plagiarize, you know, so that they can get a quick publication without having spending time to do the research? Now, a lot some of a proportion of those people would have done that regardless of the research research culture, because they're just dishonest people and they don't want to do the work. But a significant proportion are also under a lot of pressure to produce publications because their jobs depend mm. on their research output which is measured, you know, in terms of number of publications um, that they have. So there's that issue. Um, and then the other um, driving force is because researchers are under pressure to publish, then other people can exploit that situation by offering services like um, editing, um, not editing services per se, but services that look like editing services, but are in fact paper mill services, which are offering to just publish, find fabricated papers, sell authorship, and then publish those. And those people are exploiting the fact that the researchers are under pressure to publish. And the researchers are under pressure to publish because they are assessed in terms of how much they publish. So there's this whole sort of, the whole system is set up to drive research misconduct. You know, that's why people do it. Yeah, there was a, yeah, there was a campaign a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2015 or 16, by a colleague here in Germany. She's a, um, it's a hashtag bullied into bad science and basically addresses the publication pressure, publish and perish. Actually, also, it doesn't mean that the more you publish, it doesn't mean that you get um, the more cited. The, the contrary is often the case, but. Um, or country arts, it's, it's yeah, it doesn't guarantee that the more you publish, you also get more citations. So, which actually we want. And that's the whole drama, I think, also with the current setup of the scholarly publishing industry. It's like we're we're pleasing journals, we're running after prestige journal names, um, mm. where the essence of what we do is really to disseminate knowledge and we have colleagues, but also other society stakeholders look at our results and challenge our integrity. <laughs> I mean, in the sense that like, you know, to to seek feedback, to, um, to continue the conversations, to learn from and with each other. And that's hardly possible in the current system that we've brought ourselves in. Um, and why is it, like, I, I don't know if you or anyone has an answer, but why is it that researchers also fall in the prestige trap? Is it because we're human beings as well? <laughs> Probably. Yet. Oh, I think so. But I think the culture has, you know, historically been like that. When you think about um, mm. how science evolved, it, it evolved from these people who had the time and the money to potter around and make these discoveries yeah, in the 19th century, and then it was their names that are known and remembered because of their great discoveries. You know, and I think researchers want to be that next great name who will rem be remembered for that next great discovery. Mm. And, and science is not like that anymore. Yeah, science has to be collaborative. It's not going to be one person who is tinkering around in their basement who suddenly discovers the existence of oxygen, you know, it's going to be lots of people working together, bringing different types of expertise who are going to make incremental steps towards the next breakthrough. And that, so the breakthrough won't be one person. The breakthrough can only happen if there's collaboration and sharing of expertise. Mm. And that's what needs to change in the mindset. So individuals who are looking for individual, you know, personal glory um, are, are, you know, do not understand how science works. It's not about personal glory. It's about 
um, small steps, making mistakes, getting things wrong, you know, being critical of each other's methods, their findings, their results, and most importantly, repeating it, uh, repeating other people's results, finding the same findings. That's how science is validated. It's all about you know re reproducing other people's results to show that it actually you know is valid and that's the way the culture needs to move and shift towards away from personal um glory mm. but I, did, I think that in, in in the mindset of some researchers um that ideal is still what they're working towards mm. which is because historically it's been like that yeah, and it's been enforced year after year. We're currently mm -hmm. in the week of the Nobel Prizes. Yeah. Where, yeah. where individuals are being celebrated and applauded for their achievements and everybody who is a researcher knows that we are all standing on the shoulders of giants and are nurturing from other giants or dwarfs. It doesn't really matter, but we're in this together and mm -hmm. there's no success mm -hmm. for individuals unless we collaborate. Um, and yet the yeah, so I was also an admirer of the Nobel Prize, and of course, every, I think every researcher, also graduate students, they play with the idea, oh, maybe one day it's like, it's, it's first the Nature paper and then the Nobel Prize, like, really? Um, but that's also what we hear is to be striped for, and yeah, I don't know. But why can't we as researchers, you think we are um, also educated to be able to appreciate that be uh, content with having the look the privilege actually to mm -hmm. and some people say that out loud like what a privilege to be paid for like yeah. some curiosity and explorative mindset where other people ha are doomed to execute whatever they're being asked to do but we can actually keep asking questions and mm -hmm. and nurture our yeah explorative mind and and an urge and i think that's also almost like what people are what we as humans might be here for on this planet to to do for a lifetime to get to know ourselves but also our environment and to to share that knowledge and and be appreciative of the beauty of nature and whatever research topic we look at and into and isn't that enough of a fulfilling uh, thing to do on a regular basis. But then also maybe these prizes and awards and publications are also milestone achievements, which make it endurable because some people, including myself, can also be highly frustrating to keep uh, doing experiments <laughs> and mm -hmm. dealing with constant um, disappointments and frustration. And then only once in the uh, in a few years have this breakthrough moment where you celebrate with your colleagues so i don't know but it's part of the game i suppose but it's interesting to think about and question some of the statuses and the 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 stepping stones that we've established in academia well i guess it's also how the reward i mean rewards are um are given so as, as you mentioned it's a nobel prize is you know, an individual prize but that could be a, a team, you know, that could reward teamwork in a, in a better way, couldn't it? So, or, 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 or work that strives towards improving the research culture, that strives towards collaboration and data sharing and uh, reproducing other people's research. If the rewards um, shifted towards rewarding the behavior that we want, then that would have the knock-on effect of changing the current culture so then there needs to be a big you know shift in in how the re the reward and assessment system works to change the behavior um, and you can still get a kick out of making your discovery you know but it wouldn't be a personal just i did this kind of thing it would have to be nobody's going to make a huge discovery on their own yeah yeah because the, the science as i said science is not like that anymore it's not about individuals um playing around by themselves in their in their in their basements or back gardens as it was you know this is how the great mm -hmm. names in science made their discoveries but it, that's not what's happening now everybody has to have help and collaboration mm -hmm. um, in order to to do science and 
any new fantastic discovery that comes in the future will be the result of many, many people's contributions. So we should stop rewarding just, you know, one person. We should reward everybody for their contributions and reward how they did it, reward their, uh, you know, if, 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 if a discovery is made, but there was no data shared, or you know, it was not pre-registered, there's no um, effort to, to report it clearly, and someone just says, I've discovered this, but I'm not telling you how, then that is not good science. That shouldn't be rewarded. Exactly, yeah. You know. And then so, yeah, I just gave a course on open science practices, and people were really um, scared of, okay, we heard about pre-registrations, but like, who has time for that, really? And isn't it like, such a high demand for time investment before you even get started with the research and instead of actually doing the work. And then, I, I mean, knowing from experience, if you don't do that, you lose a lot of time towards the end of the research. Documentation is key, as painful, as much of a pain in the neck it actually is, like mm -hmm. also from myself. <laughs> like, I was like, ah, I documented later. It wasn't so different from the last experiment, so I don't need to document. But yes, it was like, um highly different mm -hmm. because it was just one parameter and i would have known which one if i had documented kind of thing um which made the difference to you know failed experiment or a succeeded experiment or actually getting the data you you set out to get and yeah getting the parameters right and um, but also the registered report i think what most people still on or fears that they then have to rigidly follow whatever they put down as a research plan and that's not what's expected. But the research plan is just actually to have a plan to knowingly um, get yourself into the methodologies to make an assessment before and how much time and money and equipment and materials you would use. And especially in medical research, when it comes to animal research, do you really need 5,000 or 500 mice? Or can, mm. you, can you do the same with 50? And that's a moral question to ask. And we're also talking about, um, uh, yeah, I mean, what is the vertebrates here? So they have feelings and fears and um, pain. And, and we don't have to put so many of them through if we just plan thoroughly before we can get started. Or patients' data. Um, like we could also probably use just uh, 20 patients data sets instead of 500 if we make a thorough plan and then also make a plan towards what kind of diversity in the patient's data do we need female male ethnic backgrounds like there's so many components with which have an actual influence on medical conditions or not and then also with the treatments but my my one one of my aunts used to work in medical research and she was also or her team um, they discovered that the treatments that we have for um, cardiovascular um, diseases are not differentiated against women and men. Yeah. And the, the way our bodies react are highly different just by the gender setup. And medicine was ignoring that for decades. <laughs> Yeah, it was all, all sort of uh, recruiting men for the research and then trying to apply that to women and it not working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think your, your point about um, registered reports, I mean, in clinical research, there has been trial registration for, for decades now, you know, the requirement to register the intention to do research. And there are many, many reasons for that. I mean, one of the biggest reasons is ethical reasons, because by registering your research, you're letting people know that you are doing this research. And that means that other people who are thinking of doing the same research can see um, whether it has already been done or whether this is already underway. Mm -hmm. And that then saves um, recruiting patients in studies where you know, somebody else might already be doing that research. And you know, perhaps it's better to collaborate rather than try and do a separate study of the same question exactly. at, the same at the same time. So um, just being transparent about your intention to do research has has sort of um, a, an ethical background to it, mm -hmm. and it also helps to um, eliminate the the idea, you know, the questionable practices where people will collect data and then hunt for a hypothesis by you know mm -hmm. doing lots of statistical analysis, finding a p value, mm -hmm. and then 
retrospectively fitting a hypothesis around that significant p-value so that they can write a positive um, paper. Now, that's harder to do if you've registered your intended aims and outcomes um, to begin with. And that's another reason for why trial registration was sort of put into place and implemented, was to prevent that kind of thing happening again. Mm. Uh, and that is a shift in the culture, because when I was doing research, that was what people did. I remember when I was doing my PhD, that was the normal behavior was to, oh, you've got a spreadsheet full of data, and now let's look for some, see what p-values we could get out. That that was what, and that was all because people wanted their publications. They wanted a publication that showed a positive finding. Um, and that's now a questionable research, recognized rightly as a questionable research practice, that we shouldn't be doing that. Mm. Um, and there just needs to be more of that happening across different fields. I mean, trial registration, as I said, has been around for, for years in clinical medicine and for clinical trials. Mm. But that same thing should be happening for all, all, all fields, really. But is it also medical research? Because what I mentioned earlier, the fear that some um, biologists would have, you know, if they had to write a register report or or um, or um, put up a pre-registration thing, like the, it's the same thing. Just in psychology, I think they call it register reports, whereas in life sciences, it's pre-registration or the other way around. I'm not even sure. Um, that. Like it's not meant to be followed. Which of course you you're meant to follow your plan, but if the results then turn out to to um, conquer the or counter the hypothesis, it's fine to shift the game. I mean, it's you know as long as you argue, okay, we didn't expect that to show up in our results section, um, and that actually gave rise to a high, even more interesting question, which we then pursued. I mean, that's that's how research goes. <laughs> that's exactly. It's all about transparency. So huh. it's all about you set out your intention, and then if it doesn't work out the way you intended it for whatever reason, just being transparent about what happened um, uh, and what you did. That's all that's actually required. It's not. It's not a matter of having to 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 make sure that your research fits the you know your pre-registered report if it doesn't mm. explain why not and that's okay um and that's another thing i think as you say the the you know researchers need to understand mm. yeah and or can also happily embrace and not fear that what they think would be morally agree or yeah better is actually good scientific practice and whatever else is they're being told is malpractice and mm -hmm. should avoid it. Um, I would like to, for us to maybe come towards, I could go on on this for, forever, <laughs> um, just in the interest of time. And also like I often say, you're most welcome back um, for mm -hmm. further discussions on other topics and related topics as well. Um, but to conclude in this conversation, as we've just been through peer review week in September, um, and you had a few events there or presentation here and there. Um, so what in also in the editorial process and where you specialize in with your trainings and courses that you're developing, what role does peer review play and how well, obviously for um, for quality assurance? But yeah, what are the, the key discussion points that keep you, hopefully not awake at night, but that kind of are important to you to get across to your to your clients, to, to the research stakeholders, both editors and researchers? Yeah, so, um, so going back to so peer review week, I did do um, some presentations. They were mostly related to research integrity um, rather than peer review. So I, d I did some, um, um, I moderated a session from COPE on paper mills. Um, and then I also did um, a session for COPE as well for um, you know how to manage, um, how to get started with research integrity for Great. this team. Yeah, we so, can share what COPE is for those who are not familiar. There's a what, committee of... Um, Con committee on Publication Ethics. So it's... Yeah. Um, it's a, That's a long, complicated name. This is not always <laughs> on the website, but it's, it's yeah, it's all about publication ethics and it's publication. Work. So it started off. Um, it was started off by a group of medical editors who were noticing 
that in the submissions they were receiving, that you know, there was odd things happening, misconduct, and they started talking to each other and saying, oh, is this happening on your journal? And then they formed a group to support each other and sort of discuss how they will handle these cases. Mm -hmm. And from that, this whole committee grew up starting off initially with um, journal editors as members. And the idea was they could support each other when they came across research integrity issues, um, advise each other on how to handle such cases. And now it's grown into an international organization that um, is, it, it provides support and advice for editors and publishers. Um, and it's also now opening up to institutions as well and provides lots of guidelines and training and, mm. and educational material. So I am a member of, um, of the council on this in this committee. And so I often do talks and things related to research integrity as a representative of COPE. Mm. So that's what I do quite a lot of in peer review week, talking about research integrity for editors um, and particularly around paper mills. But I did, um, I did do um, a blog post on peer review as well and where that sits in context of research integrity. And I think that the problem with peer review at the moment is that it's seen as a quality assurance mechanism within the manuscript processing you know, workflow, um, but it's not really designed to be a detector of research misconduct. It's not really designed to ensure research integrity really. It, it, it is designed to um, assess whether a piece of research seems to be scientifically sound, you know, in terms of how it's written and whether the method fits the hypothesis and whether the results are reported, whether the conclusions are supported by the results. So, you know, a person reads that as a peer reviewer and those are the things they comment on. They don't comment on, oh, yes, it's really well, you know, it, it's reproducible. Yes, the authors have shared their data or anything like that. So I, I was talking about peer review in context of research integrity and how we need to actually join it. the things that promote research integrity, such as transparency, pre-registration, data sharing, good reporting. We need to join that up with what peer reviewers look for mm. um, so that peer review can then support the right behaviors that we want to change the research culture. And we think of peer review as, um, peer review is often done for a journal, for a particular, you know, the peer reviewer is doing it for the journal editor. And we need to think of it in a bigger context. You know, peer review, regardless of whether it's for a journal or a preprint or some other reason, peer review should be about looking at a piece of research and thinking, has it been written in a way that allows it to be validated in the future by being reproduced? Is there enough information there? Is the data available? Um, are there any, is there any evidence of questionable research practices? So it's changing the whole focus of peer review. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's what was, I was arguing um, in, my, in my blog post in peer review week. So that's what I think mm -hmm. about peer review and research integrity. Yeah, well, also, if, if you agree, um, add the link to the blog post to the oh, show. Thank you, yes, that would be great, yeah. Um, so yeah, excellent. I mean, you, we were talk, I think also again, like we said earlier, most if not all researchers set out to conduct good scientific practice, and yet we find ourselves in a system that challenges that, um, mm -hmm. that kind of lets us or forces us to some extent set aside our values and moral standards, which, um, should guide and and really be the baseline for our activities as researchers. Um, yeah, maybe um, like what what are you not doing as a trainer and consultant with your own business? To well, basically on your business name is Jigisha Patel um, Research Integrity Limited. So obviously, research integrity is at, is the cornerstone of all your trainings and activities in that position now do you have like a vision of <laughs> or oh yeah what what are your what is your approach and how do you okay so like one from one entrepreneur in the scholarly system to another i just yeah it's, it's just a sort of ask the question what's what yeah what's my mission i guess what's your business model what's your yeah, what's your mission? What's your vision? Mission? My mission. 
So um, when I started as an editor, research integrity as a concept wasn't really, it didn't really exist. You know, research, well, science was sort of all based on trust and everybody accepted everything that was submitted to a journal at face value, Every, you know, the authors were being honest and everything written was true and uh, research integrity or research misconduct wasn't really recognized as a big issue or a big problem. Of course, during all the years that I've been an editor, that has completely changed. And we now know that research misconduct and is driven by the research culture, and it is a big issue in the publishing industry. There, you know, there are major problems around research misconduct in publishing. And so part of my mission is to elevate the ex expertise in research uh, integrity for editors so that they receive the training that they need to be effective in managing um, research misconduct issues that they, they come across and, and to help them to give help give them the, the, the knowledge, expertise and confidence to be able to deal with these issues because that's what's lacking. You know, scientific um, academic editors have the academic expertise, they're, they're, they're experts in their field, but they don't get the training that they need to manage journals when, when, when their journal is affected by research integrity issues. And so that is the focus um, of, of what I'm trying to do. And, and in related to that, I have created um, some training for ed editors and publishers, because that's the other big um, issue that I've seen is that editors and work publishers work together, but they work in parallel. They see themselves as sort of very different roles. And, and but but when it comes to research integrity, both editors and publishers are are equally responsible for maintaining research integrity, and therefore they need to be more collaborative and work together um, to to manage research integrity issues in their journals. And so I have created a course for publishers and editors on how to develop a research integrity strategy for their journals, even if they've never had a problem with research integrity before. Mm. It, it's it, the course helps them be prepared because sooner or later they will have an issue because it's so widespread now sooner or later every journal every publisher will have a research integrity issue mm. and so this course helps them to be prepared helps them to form a strategy that allows for collaboration as well and addresses some of the sort of common barriers that i've seen as i said you know i've dealt with thousands of cases and i see the same issues crop up that complete keep on blocking the efficient management of a case, you know, all sorts of things happen that derail the investigation of a case. And I'm sort of trying to teach people how to know about these things, preempt them and be prepared for them. So it all goes smoothly. So, mm. yes, yeah, so that's my that's my current current mission at the moment, as well as helping anyone who needs help with researching, managing research integrity mm. um, issues in, in publishing. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I'm glad we have you on the market and this in the, in the ecosystem. Um, thank you so much um, for for sharing your wisdom, your experience, your um, advice also, and and yeah, for that one infograph which, which you can see in the blog post and the images or links attached. And yeah, welcome back anytime soon. <laughs> whenever you have something else you want to share. Um, and we certainly stay in touch as we've already agreed and welcome back everyone to to the show and yeah um with your your website you can also like what's the name of your website again so people can find you it's jigisha patel all all one word and then um dash r i dot com oh, okay so yeah we also link that in the in the show notes and in the related blog post with more um yeah also your linkedin profile where people can get in touch with you when they want to seek your advice thank you so much and thank you Jill. thank you so much for inviting me it's been an absolute pleasure